morning and welcome to the latest installment in the National Security Space Association's Space Time Interview Series. My name is Chris Williams, and I have the great privilege of serving as chair of the association's Mormon Center for Space Studies. We're deeply honored to have with us today Rear Admiral Mike Bernacki, the Director of Strategy, Plans, and Policies, J5, at U.S. Space Command. Admiral, welcome. Rear Admiral Bernacki is a native of Pleasant Ridge, Michigan, and graduated from the University of Detroit. He also holds a <clears throat> master's degree from University of Michigan in nuclear engineering and industrial engineering. His operational tours include service aboard both attack and ballistic missile submarines, including the USS James Madison, the USS Albuquerque, and USS Santa Fe. He commanded the USS Alexandria and was Commodore of Submarine Squadron 4 in Connecticut. Ashore, he served as Executive Assistant to the Vice Chief of Naval Operations, Executive Assistant to the Chief of Naval Personnel, Chief of Staff for Submarine Group 2, Deputy Nuclear Community Program Manager, Special Assistant to Naval Reactors for Office Matters, and Cruise Missile Planner for Theater Operations at U.S. Strategic Command. Previous flag assignments include Commander Naval Service Training Command, where he was privileged to serve with a staff that was recognized with a Navy unit commendation, at the time only five previously awarded to shore commands in the last 30 years, and Commander Subgroup 10 in Kings Bay, Georgia. He is entitled to wear the Legion of Merit, eight awards, Defense Meritorious Service Award, or excuse me, Service Medal, and various personal unit and service awards. He was recognized by the Navy League while commanding officer of USS Alexandria with the John Paul Jones Award for inspirational leadership. A brief word about our format today. Rear Admiral Bernacki will make some opening remarks and then we will turn to questions and answers. For the audience, if you have questions for Admiral Bernacki, please submit those via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. I'll do my best to get through all your questions and we'll wrap up uh, today's interview at noon Eastern Daylight Time. Admiral, thanks again for taking time to be with us today and thank you for your service to our great nation. The floor is yours for whatever opening remarks you wish to make, sir. Thank you so much, Chris. I'll make it relatively quick. I guess uh, as I was listening to you read my bio, uh, given the nature of what this is about, uh, national security space, if I was one of your listeners or viewers, the first thing I would say is, uh, why is this guy doing space? And you know what? That would be a great question. Uh, when I got the call to say, hey, we're going to nominate uh, you for uh, J5 at Space Command, I kind of laughed. I said, hey, what's that? Uh, at the time, I was in charge of all the ballistic missile and cruise missile submarines on the East Coast. And uh, I'll be honest, I kind of thought it was a joke. Um, but then I quickly found out it was not, uh, and they were very serious. Uh, I will tell you, as a nuclear propulsion officer for 30 plus years in the Navy, our program is incredibly technical. And uh, as I was briefing very recently, the Secretary of Defense on space, I kind of had to answer the same question to him. And I realized that space, uh, like undersea, is very technical, dark, cold, and unforgiving. And so those things being in common, you also have to make decisions based on partial information. So when I realized that this was gonna be real, I immediately became a very intense study uh, everything from orbital mechanics to policy. And then arriving here, I began a qualification program and began to realize how similar the two worlds really are. As an engineer, the math was actually easy. I actually married an editor just so my children would have a fighting chance in life. Uh, so that worked out very well. Uh, we've been together for 37 years. Congratulations. Thank you. I will tell you, as you look at this domain, I think the American public has no idea how dependent their lives are actually on space. In 2020, for example, there were 2,990 satellites launched. The majority, over half, were from US companies. Space powers the American way of life. Our prosperity is dependent on space, hence, the American military and the joint force in particular will do what is necessary to defend the American way of life. And so that is why US Space Command was reconstituted 
and why U.S. Space Force was broken off to be an independent force in order to help do exactly that. You know, I joke when you look at the Constitution with my Army friends that uh, it specifically states that you will raise an army, which means you only need it when you need it, but you shall maintain a Navy. Um, so we're the only service guaranteed by the Constitution. And the only reason that our founding fathers did that was of course to protect the sea lanes, which means merchant trade. You know, 90% of everything that we get comes by sea. And when you take a look at what space is becoming, it's a, the exact same thing our economy, our way of life, our allies' economies, they all are completely dependent on space. So it's important that we understand, hey, this isn't just something that we wanted to do. This is something that's an absolute necessity for America's well-being. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to you uh, as we go through. That's great. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate your opening comments. Uh, U.S. Space Command was reestablished in August of 2019, coming up on two years uh, now. What progress has been made in the build out of the command and what work remains? And overall, where would you say the command is in terms of achieving its personnel and funding objectives and its ability to carry out its mission? Now, that's a great question. I will tell you, when I first got here, which is just about a year ago, uh, the amount of progress is enormous. Um, but I think you also have to look at things in perspective. It took about 10 years for Cybercom uh, really to become FOC. And they're still having what they call them tanks right in the Pentagon to see what eventual final manning is going to look like when they look at their cyber teams, et cetera. So they're still in the finalization of their maturation process, and we're not even two years old. That being said, I can tell you we are moving with speed. Uh, our boss, General Dickinson, God bless him, he is not a patient man, and he, does, uh, he wants to build out as fast as possible. I can tell you we signed out our first campaign plan, and we're working very hard on our first what we call contingency plan. Typically, it takes two years to do a contingency plan with a staff of about 200 planners. I have a staff of about 60 planners, and we're looking to get that done in a year. So to put it in perspective, a quarter of the people and half the time. Um, and that's integrating with all the other combatant commands. We took responsibility for Operation Olympic Defender, uh, which is the day-to-day -day operations of space. Um, we formally recognized two functional components, uh, a JTF and CIFSIC in Vandenberg, and we have service components. Uh, we are participating right now in our first major exercise, uh, Pack Fury. Right now, I have my deputy, and yes, I'm not the ops guy, uh, but with uh, Spacecom, you're going to find it's uh, all hands on deck. Uh, for everything. So my deputy, uh, Brigadier General Pepper, is in Hawaii right now. Um, and yeah, he did get a good deal. Uh, but I sent him out there. He's leading a team of 20 uh, as we exercise how we're integrating space warfare capabilities uh, with the combatant command in a major exercise. This is the first time you know, due to COVID and everything else, we're able to exercise those kinds. I will tell you that we in the five just a month ago issued a plan order, a planning order for us to look at how we're going to, even though we're not two years old, how we're going to restructure. And so uh, the last commandant of the Marine Corps, one of his favorite sayings, uh, and I used to love to hear him talk, was uh, change or die. And right, we had an idea of what we were going to have to be, but you also have to analyze, take data, get the feedback, and then change and adapt. Right, everything we do in space is to enable, right, the American way of life and the terrestrial combatant command to deter. And God forbid, if deterrence fails, uh, it's to fight and win. Uh, hopefully, we never get there, but we got to be ready. 
And so as we look at it, we know that we have to shift and become more efficient and more effective in order to enable the joint force. And so as we did, we put a plan order on to say, hey, how can our command structure become more effective looking at that? So we're working with General Whiting, who is the SPOC commander here, um, right? Who would be the senior most capable uh, space war fighter and how we're gonna combine some of our elements under him. And then our commander would give him orders and then he would take forces and then go out as well as how we do it in a land component and then eventually a maritime component. So a little bit more traditional, the way you think of a combatant command, but it also allows those combatant commands to more easily integrate. So lots of change, uh, people resist change, but you have to make them understand why it's a benefit. So a lot going on, uh, a lot of products, uh, we went and briefed SecDef already on part of the integrated deterrence, which was a huge deal. Um, you know, he liked it. Uh, we also went and supported Indo-PACOM in their contingency planning. So even though we're very young, we're not even at FOC. Uh, I think we're about at almost half Manning. But what we found out, Chris, is nobody cares. Um, nobody says, hey, you know, you're only half Manning. We'll give you 50% of the work. They're like, hey, there's a space com, boom. Uh, you know, so in three years, I think we're supposed to be at full Manning. Uh, and eventually with the, hopefully we'll have a decision on basing. Uh, I will tell you that, you know, we don't have really anything to do with that, but until that final decision and those reports and studies are all done, that's a real hindrance uh, as well. But, you know, the team just buckles down. Does that answer your question? That's that's fantastic. Really appreciate it. Uh, you obviously have lots going on. Uh, for those uh, of our viewers who may not know what a J5 organization is or what it does, what what's kind of a typical day in the life of the J5 at U.S. Space Command? Um, you, you mentioned a number of things. You have folks uh, engaged in major exercises in the in the Pacific theater, you have uh, uh, ongoing activities related to Operation Olympic Defender, you have plan orders being generated, but what, what's, uh, what's a typical day like um, in, in, the, in the work of your, your organization there? Chris, once I have one, I tell you, <laughs> um, you know, again, Every I, I say that tongue in cheek, um, but I'm also deadly serious. <laughs> we, it, it really is kind of, hey, many hands make light work and whatever it is that you know the boss needs us to do we'll do so we've been working a global xor which is traditionally a j3 function you know that uh, an execution order that tells hey how we're going to do business we've been working that since november mm -hmm. uh, we got a new j3 on board which is like i said that is that is j3 type work that's operations um, and now we're kind of going to turn that over to them. Uh, last week, it's funny you mentioned that. Um, we actually had a meeting. I go back to the change or die. I inherited a traditional Napoleonic structure. We had a 5-1, a 5-2, a 5-3, a 5-5, a 5-6, a 5-9. And we still have those numbers, but what we found out as we started to grow is, hey, it's, it's not fitting what our unified, com unified command plan missions are. And so, you know, the president said, Spacecom, you're gonna do the following things. And again, like I said, nobody cares if you're manned or not manned, it says you're gonna go do these things. And, you know, we have the missions in space which we have to execute. And so we kind of realigned last week and we're working as we go through. So. I have a contingency plans um, division. So they're writing what would be the war plans for space. Mm -hmm. So that'll be the first ever. Um, then we have, this is brand new. This is what we're calling a net assessment. Um, and this is where you can think AI, quantum computing, um, war gaming, uh, strategy and advanced war fighting concepts. So there's never been a war in space. 
thank goodness. <laughs> uh, but if there is, you know, how is it going to go? And so there's been a ton of games, war games. You have Shriver war games, you have this, but we actually have run the first ever uh, joint pub 5-0 war game just a month ago. And this is a traditional type of, hey, if I have to fight right now, how is that going to go? Uh, a turn-based computer, you know, right with what, what kit, what, you know, things you have. Um, and then you look at it, all right, hey, how do you bring in the political aspects of an adversary? How do you bring in their thinking architecture, right? I have, I have professors, you know, all over the place. Like if I'm going to do a maritime, I can go to the Naval War College and I have a lot that I can draw from. You know, that type of architecture doesn't exist for space, um, you know. Russia and China, for example, they're still figuring that out too. So it's a, it's a brave new world and we're looking at, hey, how do we combine some of the expertise that does exist on a Paul Mill side of the house, the State Department side of the house, military side of the house, and how can I use some of the advanced AI capabilities that we do, which I am like very familiar in the undersea world, uh, and aviation does the same thing with an aggressor squadrons and building those kinds of sims so I can do rapid testing and prototype testing uh, in a lab environment and then bring those to bear. So that's a, we're very excited. That's a brand new division. We're just standing up right now. Uh, I'm actually, I'll have an army strategist in charge of that. Uh, then I actually have a strategy department, kind of our deep thinkers. And then I have our outreach, our partnerships. And this, you can think of international, interagency, uh, security cooperation, uh, academics, interagency, you know, all those outreaches, the uh, SSA agreements, um, all that kind of stuff all gets funneled there. Um, I actually made a by name call. I brought in a, a Navy post major commander I've known for many, many years, who's a superstar. And I'm like, uh, hey, I'm going to give you an offer you can't refuse. Uh, and he accepted. He was smart. And then we in the five are part of, they were going to be integrated planning elements. They were supposed to just do plans. But as I told you, now they're doing ops. They're doing uh, training. They're doing everything. And those are in all of the other co-comps. And so that's why my deputies out there doing it right now. Um, it's because I own all those people. And so, you know, we're doing a little bit of that. I work with the three, I work with the two, I work with the seven, uh, both here at our command, but at the other commands as well. And then lastly, I'll tell you the traditional policy and doctrine. So that's kind of way we're organized. I'll tell you, I have a massive 60 people doing all of that right now. <laughs> and then I got about another 40 or so 45 in the field um, doing that. It's about half civilian, half military. I tell you, the civilians are going to be critical uh, going forward. The DOD or Department of Air Force civilians, uh, they're going to be the glue that keeps this place together. Um, because as you know, military come and go, but the civilians will be the culture uh, and the expertise if this place is going to survive and really thrive. So that, that's kind of the five. I would like to tell you I know what a, a single day or a simple day looks like, um, but I don't think I mean, we've ever had that, two right. days that look the same. Right, right. Understand. Um, let me shift to, uh, to classification issues. As you well know, Generals Hyten and Raymond, among others, have expressed frustration with overclassification of certain space systems and capabilities. How should one balance uh, the near-term desire for enhanced deterrence with withholding certain capabilities that help could help win a, a, in a conflict in space? And uh, overall, is a layered security architecture, that is uh, analogy of an on onion skin with multiple security layers across different categories and umbrella portfolios, the best approach to this challenge? How, how do you think about the issue of deterring and 
and uh, uh, revealing versus concealing certain capabilities, sir. Yeah, do you remember, I'm, you're uh, probably uh, like me, old enough. You remember the movie, Dr. Strangelove? Yes, sir. Yeah, <laughs> if you don't know about it, right? It's, uh, I, I'm, in, I'm in violent agreement with, uh, with my boss, with General Hyten and General Raymond. Uh, and it's not because they're all four stars, it's because they're right. <laughs> Uh, in Mike's opinion, is the overclassification is killing us. Um, and it also is, hey, what do they, what does the adversary believe or not believe? So absolutely, I also, uh, for my time under C, there are some systems that you're going to want to keep in reserve uh, in case you got to use them to win. And so I, I, I'm all about that. Uh, but you can't keep everything in reserve. And so what I've noticed coming into this world is almost everything in space is sap. Okay, well, what's the point? If, if everything in, in space is of such a classification level, I can't share it with the allies. I can't share it with my fellow services. And it, it goes, I mean, I joke, but it's serious. I had to take a polygraph to get in the building. I'm like, are you, are you kidding me? I mean, you, you get to a point where it's just, it's not productive. And I'll give you another example where I was in a tri meeting with Cybercom and Indopaycom, the J5s, and we're working on coordinated integrated plans, mm -hmm. uh, much in the line of integrated deterrence. You know, how do we make sure that we never get to the point where we're committing forces and our youth, uh, you know, into battle because of a miscalculation, misunderstanding, you know, how do we make sure that the deterrence always holds, that it's just not worth it to either side to commit forces to battle. And when we started going into it, the three guys that were left in the room that had all the clearances were the two admirals and the one general. Well, I make, I'm good, but I'm not that great an action officer anymore. And so when the planners can't even have the clearances to write the plan, you know, that's a recipe for disaster. So those are the things that we really got to work through um, because cyber and space are going to go first, I promise you. And so all you have to do is look at the attack on our pipeline, look at the attack on our food supply, I mean, right, those cyber attacks, I mean, cyber and space are going first. I mean, I, you don't have to be a military genius to figure that one out. And so we got to make sure that we have the right classification levels. So at least our planners and our thinkers, you know, at the 05, 06 levels can cross talk amongst the command so we can integrate our capabilities uh, and use them. So Absolutely, I think there are a couple of capabilities you got to keep in the kit bag just in case. So they're like, oh my goodness, today is not the day I miscalculated. Um, so there is some of that, but then you also have to have it. So day to day, they know, you know what? Today is not the day to cross the street. You know, I used to say, right? You don't walk across the street to get your butt beat. You just don't. And, and they got to know that, hey, if I'm going to walk across the street, I am going to get my butt beat. I mean, right? that, that's American way of deterrence, so to speak. But you also have to understand their version of deterrence and how they perceive it, which is different than ours. Right. So all of that has to go into the calculus. And so you got to be able to take all aspects of that and then understand what we want to reveal, when we want to reveal it, and that's critical. Um, to the adversary, what we can share amongst ourselves, how, what networks we can share those on. I mean, all of that's got to get put in and we can't make everything so hard to access that we can't even talk to each other. Let me shift, thank you very much. Uh, let me shift to, uh, to the National Reconnaissance Office. Um, the command obviously works closely with many federal departments and agencies, including various IC agencies and especially the NRO. Can you talk about the state of the relationship between the command and the NRO and what progress has been made in this area since uh, uh, Space Policy Directive 4 was issued and what do you see as the outstanding issues to be addressed? There have been 
obviously some noteworthy uh, developments as it relates to command relationships in time of crisis and, and other things, but how would you characterize the overall uh, relationship with the NRO today? I would tell you, I think we have a very special, uh, very close relationship with the NRO. I would tell you, I think it's seamless in a lot of ways uh, and it's mutually supporting, right? The NRO has its own mission, uh, which is separate and distinct from ours, which is important. Uh, but we have to know what they're doing when they're doing it. Uh, so part of it is so we stay out of each other's way. <laughs> Part of it is so their information can support our operations. And part of it is so we can protect them. So, you know, they don't take orders from us uh, unless it's in a, you know, wartime or emergency type situation. Uh, but they are relying on a lot of our information and we're reliant on their information. So I would tell you, we're both kind of mutually dependent on each other. Uh, and I have uh, routine touch points with their operations officer uh, discussing. Uh, so we talk through policy, we talk through ops, we talk through almost everything. You know, I tell you, it's a uh, mutual respect among peers uh, as we go through and discuss things. We go through exercises together. Uh, if there is an emergency or if there is a bad actors doing things, we coordinate and discuss. Uh, we run through exercises together on how we're going to do it. Um, you know, I have, when we're doing plans, I get inputs from them. Um, and when they're doing things, they come to us for inputs. So I would tell you, you know, our relationship continues to grow uh, as we continue to build out and, you know, because we're doing things that we've never done before. Uh, we get, they have a lot of expertise. And uh, they're coming to us as they look to build new architects, uh, architectures and, and systems and say, hey, how would this integrate with you? So it's a, I would tell you it's a great relationship uh, as I see it from, from uh, my standpoint. That's fantastic. Let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, friends and allies. Um, you mentioned that uh, the command has formally established relationships with various other nations to share space situational awareness data uh, and, and, and work closely in different areas. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the set of relationships that exist with governments, other governments in, on military space matters? And what, are these, uh, what value do these relationships bring to the command, number one? And number two, specifically, as you, I'm sure you're aware, uh, just uh, a week or so ago, NATO heads of state issued a communique that recognized the growing importance for space of space for NATO deterrence and, and defense. And they noted, quote, that attacks on space systems could lead to the invocation of Article 5. Um, and, and further noted, a decision as to when such attacks would lead to the invocation of Article 5 would be taken by the North Atlantic Council on a case-by-case -case basis. How important is that declaration and what does it mean in practice for the command's plans and, and operations? You mentioned Olympic Defender and various other activities. How does that factor in? Well, I would tell you, it's all, when I look at it, we're all growing more and more to the, to the steps of, hey, how important space is as a domain. You know, some of them call it an operational domain some of them call it a war fighting domain, but no matter what you call it, everybody is starting to recognize it as a domain, a, a domain of importance, a domain of economic uh, importance, a, a domain of military importance, a domain of, hey, I got to have access and a domain where we have to work together. So when you look at China and Russia in particular, um, you know, I would tell you Mike's personal opinion, and I think it's shared by many military, is our secret sauce is we don't go it alone, right? Our secret sauce is when we come, we usually come with friends and allies. That's one thing democratic societies typically do. We may not always get along on everything, but right, the United States has never gone to war with another democratic nation. And typically when push comes to shove, 
if something horrific happens, democratic nations stand together. And so the fact that we're getting to the place where we recognize space as an area where we will stand together to protect our mutual interests is huge. All right, I mean, we're at, we, we've never been there before, but the fact that we're doing that. So we've gone from things where, you know, we have the Com Combined Space Operations Initiative, which is six countries. Uh, we have the Combined Space Center. Uh, you know, we had the SSAs. Uh, we're working together on, you know, international norms, all those kind of things. That's all awesome, but you know, where does it lead to? If you talk to, um, you use NATO as an example, right? That's, that's an alliance formed by treaties, right? Those are binding treaties uh, that says, hey, we're gonna protect each other. If you go to Indopaycom, Cybercom, you know, any other COCOMs, they'll have these bilateral treaties that says, hey, you know, I'm signing up that we're gonna defend each other. You know, I'm proud to announce that for the first time in space, you know, that's where we're going. And so um, in September, uh, one of my deputies will be a British general. And so we are going uh, to the place where we're starting to enter negotiations with uh, countries where we're going into bilateral treaty agreements like other COCOMs that says, hey, we're gonna defend each other um, and go into this is how we're going to do it and integrate those officers on the combatant command staff. And we've never done that before. And so I have a French officer coming, all right, integrated in the headquarters, right? We've never done that before. Uh, we're working agreements right now with several other countries uh, allies that you could probably guess. Uh, we haven't signed the paper, so I'm holding off, but I, I've gotten verbal agreements from them. Um, and so by next summer, we should have one, two, three, four, five, five nations co-located in our headquarters. And we're actually integrating them into the base plans, which no COCOM has done. So we actually are calling it Allied Plans Division um and they'll be integrated into our campaign plan and our canton and our contingency plan so we're going to have these negotiations before hopefully anything bad happens uh and that way when it does if it ever does it says hey here's the agreement ahead of time are you ready to respond you know and the answer should be yes so i think these are huge steps space is expensive as you know uh, but it's so vital, just like we do. I mean, to me, the parallel is so easy on the seas. We already have these agreements uh, on the open ocean uh, with many of these nations, and we will come to each other's aid. And so it's the same type of deal. So drawing these parallels um, in space is, is pretty simple for me uh, to do. And as we talk with these nations, uh, we have our first mill-to-mill -mill discussions coming up here uh, in a month or so, and we'll start working towards those actual bilateral treaties. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, can you provide some insights into the status of and implications for the joint warfighting concept, the recently promulgated uh, joint warfighting concept for U.S. Space Command? And likewise, what's the command's role in defining and operating a joint all domain command and control or JADC2 capability? How and how would fielding an effective JADC2 capability impact US SpaceCom plans and operations? You know, that's a great question. I will tell you, I think most of the opportunities to accelerate advances in the all domain uh, operational capabilities, particular in the areas of the C5 ISR and our ability to gather, uh, synthesize, and distribute relative information, combat power, uh, all that will evolve as we continue to build out Space Command. Our J7, our J3, uh, and obviously the five, we're all in the early stages of how, that'll look at, how that will look. I will tell you, we did some experimentation in Pac-Fury um, on, on exactly what that is. 
So we're doing a major shift. And what I mean by that is before COCOMs would kind of look at space as kind of just a service provider. Hey, give me SATCOM, give me GPS, uh, give me this so I can get precision, um, you know, precision fires, um, whatever it was. Um, now we're looking at, hey, space is a global fight. And, you know, the the terrestrial COCOM still obviously have a critical role, but in space, we're not inhibited by the lines in the map. And so maybe the best support that you could give into PACOM actually comes from being able to do something in an orbital regime from uh, uh, a terrestrial capability that's in the Atlantic. I mean, you understand just from where associate capabilities are for the adversary, et cetera, et cetera. So it really becomes that kind of global picture, uh, which is a, is a totally different way of thinking and say, hey, we're, because we're not inhibited by lines, this idea of how we integrate that into the joint war fighting concept, um, you know, a lot of people think, hey, I got to own it. If I don't own it, then it doesn't matter. And what we're saying is, hey, we don't necessarily, we don't need to own it. We just need an effect from something you might own uh, for a short time. And let's work on the C2 and how we're going to execute that so it's efficient and effective um, so I can help you. So even when we're a supported command, it's really help me help you uh, get what you need because we don't do anything in space for space sake. Uh, you know, as a Navy guy, that's really easy for me to say. I'm like, you know, and that's kind of, I think what makes this command unique is what drives it is the space professionals. I mean, the Space Force, the Army, FA-4, I mean, the guys who've been, gals who've been doing space their whole lives. What brings, I think, a little bit of realism to it is you know, those of us who are learning space the hard way, uh, but also bring a career of terrestrial fighting and saying, hey, this is why I need it. Um, and that unique blend, I think, is what really is powerful. And if you listen to General Dickinson, my boss, um, he'll tell you, hey, this is why we can get things done pretty quickly. It's because you have the joint warfighter perspective right here at the command. Uh, and then you have the space experts, you know, who've been doing this their whole lives. You say, okay, that's the way, but then you got to do A, B, and C. Uh, and so that combination of having us all in one place is what really makes it work and why I think we're going to be able to really push the joint warfighting concepts that have to do with space. Thank you. Let's shift to the, the threat a little bit. Uh, Russia and China have conducted numerous tests of various counter space capabilities ranging from a direct ascent and co-orbital ASATs systems to jamming to laser dazzling of US satellite systems. What do you see as the most threatening of these foreign counter space capabilities and why? And wh where do you see the threat? How do you see the threat evolving in the coming years? Yeah, the little devils. Um, I will tell you, the thing that actually scares me the most is if you go back six years ago, China had almost nothing. Now you look at them and the ability for China to exponentially grow their counter space capability is, is scary. I mean, I don't know how else to put it. The next thing is the ability for them to integrate in a cross domain capability and start to show this in their exercises is even more scary. Um, and so, you know, where is this exponential growth and cross domain capability going to stop? And the answer is, I don't know. So if you ask me, you know, what would I say is the, the part that would keep me up at night? You know, as a general mass who say nothing keeps me up at night, I want to keep them up at night. So I but if, there, if there's something that would give me pause, um, that would give me pause on, wow, you know, the growth rate, um, because right, there is no military or, or civilian 
in, in China, everything is dual use. And speaking of dual use, you know, what they have up in space, you know, their dual use technology, you know, from satellites with robotic arms, uh, all of that is the rate of growth um, and the sheer numbers uh, are just, hey, so that is then kind of the hypocrisy of, oh, hey, we're not weaponizing space. Uh, I mean, uh, really? <laughs> I mean, so, and then when you look at it, right, everything they want to do is legally binding, da, da, da. They, they want to get into the letter of the law to try and, because, right, the United States will always honor its treaties. I mean, that's what, I mean, again, as a democratic nation, we always do that. Uh, and let's just, I'm not going to get into, I am not a, a lawyer and if my JAG was here, um, but let's just say we always do and I'll leave it at that <laughs> uh, going through. So that I would tell you is just the sheer rate of growth. Um, so we have to make sure that Spacecom, I mean, why we exist is to deter that aggression. And we have to make sure, I mean, we're never going to go man for man. We've never done that in our history. Right, it's not, hey, uh, even in the Cold War, right? We were outnumbered submarines. I go back to my, my base roots, right? We were outnumbered submarines quite significantly. Some places, seven, eight to one. Uh, but that didn't bother us, right? It has to do with, hey, what is the capability? You know, what is the magazine size? What is, you know, all those things? What's the training? Uh, what's the people advantage? Uh, it's more about outthinking, outmaneuvering uh, than just sheer size. But we have to respect the growth rate um, and the capability that has happened in the last six years. I have a, uh, a question from the audience. It says, how do you see the Navy's role in evolving the culture of the Space Force and Space Command going forward? Um, I see the Navy's role much like uh, the other services is, you know, we bring a pretty rigorous uh, watch mentality, uh, even yesterday. So I was sitting space attack assessor and there was some talk about, hey, well, we're gonna do this or we're gonna, and I'm like, cease and desist. You know, I have the watch, are you relieving me? And it was like, oh, no, sir, no, I'm like, you know, just the, hey, there's one person who has the rose pinned on them. Um, we're gonna sit in a formal organization and the, just the rigidity of watch structure organization as we, as we go through this. I think we can bring that aspect to it. Great, the next thing that I've actually talked to um, fleet commanders as recently as uh, this week, a matter of fact, I have a meeting with a, a, a fleet commander today, is where you are in the world, especially if you want to do something terrestrially uh, and have go into space and have a space effect for all those who understand space, probably a lot better than me at times, um, is very important. And 70% of the world is water. And so the Navy can really contribute um, on that aspect of it, meaning that we can go places and do things, uh, especially outside of the preferred SOCI range of adversaries or potential adversaries and cause effects, especially in low earth orbit, uh, which could be attributable or non-attributable uh, as we go through, just because we can get there and nobody else can. And so as we continue to evolve this, um, I mean, space and cyber are gonna be the key domains that we have to compete uh, day to day and if necessary, win first, because that, that's where it's gonna be. And so that's where I see the Navy uh, is gonna be able to really bring and contribute uh, to the space game. Thank you, have another uh, uh, Navy focused question. It says, as a submariner, you're well aware of the Navy's critical dependence on space and space enabled global communications and intelligence to carry out its mission. At the same time, a recent New York Times bestseller by Admiral Jim Stavridis and Elliot Ackerman shows 
the US Navy getting hammered in a war with China in 2034, not very far out. The book is nominally fiction, but it's pretty well-informed fiction. And while it does not include a lot of detail on how and why it turns out the way it does, control of space, as you mentioned, is clearly a key element. In your current position, what do you see as the main challenges to change the ending of Admiral Stavridis's book, if you will? As a submariner, what does the Navy have to do better or more of to support the space enterprise? And what unique contributions can the Navy make to space? Well, I, I got to be honest, I haven't read the book. <laughs> so I will tell you, you know, now it's space, uh, before it was nuclear weapons. And I, I will get to the question, but, you know, the character of war is constantly changing uh, because of the introduction of new weapons, technology, operational ideas. Uh, but the nature of war is enduring. You know, I think it was uh, 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 Eusides who talked about, hey, fear, honor, and interest, if I remember my history right, was the root cause of almost all war uh, going through. And so when you take a look at it, hey, we're in a new technology era in space. And so it really becomes hey, how do you now then engage in the gray zone uh, like cyber so that there's never, as our boss would say, there's never a day without space. And so space enables information. Space enables uh, almost all aspects of what we do from a warfare perspective. So the United States is gonna have to ensure with its allies which is why we're building this such broad coalition uh, as we go forward, that we're always in a position um, that we have the high ground or the ultimate high ground, I guess, if you call in space uh, to enable all the capabilities, uh, not just with the Navy, but with the Army uh, and with all the services uh, kind of going forward. And so, in the book, if the Navy were to get wiped out, that assumes that we have lost all of the advantages that we would have in space. And our job as Spacecom, and I spend every waking hour here is one, writing plans that deter, but God forbid if deterrence fails, writing plans that ensure our victory up in space. Um, I mean, that's my job. And I have a brilliant team of very highly dedicated professionals who work every day to ensure that happens, um, really for the prosperity of the American people. I mean, that's what drives us every day. And so it's not just the military side of the house, which is very important, um, but it's the day-to-day -day life of what you see. I mean, you see in cyber what happens, um, you know, hackers get in, they shut down the American East Coast. Uh, from a fuel standpoint. So it's a real game we take very seriously. And, uh, you know, all aspects of it are to make sure that we always have freedom of access to space, just like freedom of access to the sea. Thank you. Uh, another question from the audience is, can you speak to how the command is implementing recent guidance for integration of commercial space situational awareness? And are there appropriate uh, channels and venues for companies to contribute to the evolving needs of the command? And I would even broaden the question, what's your overall take on, on whether to what extent commercial uh, companies and capabilities can contribute to the mission of the command? And how, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, I would tell you the short answer to your question is not only yes, but absolutely without a doubt, yes. Um, commercial space really is space. I mean, you know, the numbers I gave you of the 2,990, I mean, the government portion of that, the U.S. government portion of that, and, and this part I'm trying to remember, I think it's like 2%. I mean, civilian industry owns space, have no doubt. I mean, God bless, right? Elon Musk puts an antenna on a pizza box, shoots it up. I mean, right, we're good to go. Um, 
we have to learn how to work with and leverage the commercial industry because they can do it very cost efficiently, effective, um, and we partner with them all the time. So we have a separate cell in one of our components that is an industry partner cell. And so we work with our industry partners day to day, uh, everything from communication to imagery to um, you know, all aspects, and I can't go much beyond that on an unclassified net. Um, but right, when you talk resiliency, um, you know, I don't, I don't need a uh, little space humor here, right? I don't need the Death Star satellites anymore. They're targets, right? What I want is the widespread, um, give me a couple thousand of the smaller satellites with good capabilities that are almost impossible to take them all out. Um, and industry is awesome at that. And so as we continue to evolve in our uh, industrial cell, which we have, where our, our industry partners literally sit side by side with us and they, they work um, and they grow all these different capabilities, which, you know, it's not just obviously military, they, they do it for, for their own purposes and sell it as well. And then we buy space uh, on that. That is, I see the long-term um, solution to a lot of our resiliency uh, issues. Then using some of the quantum technology, uh, we use that from a cryptological standpoint. That allows us then to secure a lot of those types of networks as well. So yes, absolutely. I tell you the future is incredibly bright for the military industry partner. And I'll be honest with you, they, we as a, a military, we just cannot move as fast as industry can uh, on a lot of issues. And so we turn to industry uh, for a lot of solutions and because you know, they are not afraid, you know, if you, you know, you read the books and you go through, they're not afraid to fail fast forward um, and then take some risk and then, and then boom, come up with solutions uh, and think even more outside the box than the military traditionally would, you know, especially in things like space. I mean, we're able to do things we partnered uh, in some of our projects uh, where we would not have been able to get there without our industrial partners. So I'm a, I'm a huge fan, <laughs> having now been here for a while, of what industry can do for us. Uh, and I think as we bring in uh, our allies um, and we're able to bring down some of the barriers on security as far as classification, uh, I'm even more excited at, hey, some of the things that I hope open up for them uh, with some of the industry partnerships that we have that they'll be able to take advantage of, including growing their own indigenous capabilities, working with our partners. I mean, right, it's good, it's business, it's, you know, uh, economies grow. I mean, let's face it, you know, it's expected to be a multi-trillion dollar industry. It has good for everybody. That's high paying jobs, <laughs> that's tech. I mean, so, I mean, everybody wins here. That's great, thank you. Let's turn for a moment to norms of behavior in space. Uh, there's a lot of discussion, obviously, these days, a lot of interest in, in norms of behavior. What types of norms make the most sense? And do you distinguish between space arms control and norms of behavior in space? And secondly, in developing norms of behavior, should the US focus at least initially on working with friends and allies before trying to gain the concurrence of Russia and China? Okay, that's a lot. Uh, I will tell you, and I spent about three and a half hours yesterday doing the uh, CISPO conference and we were talking about this with some of our closest allies. So, you know, from, let's talk strictly military here. From a military standpoint, I would tell you, we can talk about safe and professional military behavior. The military does not put norms on civilians. That's not our job. That's a violation of the United States Constitution. Okay, we talk about um, safe and professional military behavior. 
be very clear on that. Break. We had the State Department with us yesterday, right, representing the whole of the US government because the State Department and the Department of Commerce who eventually will in regulate um, like the uh, uh, FAA does for air traffic, the Department of Commerce will for civilian space traffic, right? But the Department of State can talk about norms of behavior for what internationally will be and for working with the rest of government on norms of space behavior for civilian corporations, right? Because as the US military, we can talk about responsible behavior, what we view in a military perspective, but from a governmental perspective, right? That's a whole of government. We can give our input to the DOD uh, and the secretary, and then he can bring that in. So I want, want to make sure those lines stay clear as we go through this, that we as Spacecom would never try and impose or say what we think um, the civilian should do because that's not our place as the department or as a, a combatant command. Great. I definitely think working, when we do work with our allies and partners quite often on, hey, what is responsible behavior from a military perspective, right? I mean, we do it all the time. In the maritime domain, we have closure areas. If we're going to launch uh, a, a weapon, you know, test a missile, same thing in the air domain. Um, we have uh, distress channels. Uh, channel 16 on the high seas, so you can understand intentions or send a warning. I mean, there's a lot of similarities, right? It took hundreds of years to get the laws of the sea. Uh, and I just, I don't think we have that much time uh, in the space domain. As we go through, you can take a look at the, uh, you know, recently with the, um, what was it, the Long Five, I'll get the, the, rock, the Chinese rocket body. Um, I got it written down here somewhere. Anyways, the uh, Long March 5, I believe it was, you know, the uncontrolled reentry. you know, I think we all agree, hey, that was probably um, not responsible because they didn't know where it was going to come down and it could have caused, you know, death. <laughs> so, hey, that, as we go through this, um, there's definitely the difference between us and Russia and China is they want to immediately go to a legally binding, you know, very legal, legalistic, where when you take a look at most nations uh, with space programs want to go to, uh, and you talk with their state departments, and that's who we had. We had the State Department or equivalents um, in our talks yesterday, talking about, hey, a, a norms type because it's more about, hey, what is the spirit, you know, of responsibility vice, oh, trying to do a legalistic letter of the law uh, type issue. And so you got to give credence to, hey, there, there's a lot of smart people in all of these countries have been doing space for a long time too, uh, besides just us. You know, the UK came up with a great proposal uh, up in the United Nations, which we generally support looking at a lot of that. So we talk about that. So I do think we have to get there. It's a whole of government. Um, we're part, we give input, our input into the DOD uh, through OSD space policy. Uh, and there, there are arm that wings into all of that. Um, but yes, I think there are some things that we can agree on pretty easily uh, and we should work to do that. You know, debris is bad. All right, I think we can all agree. Hey, we, you know, those kind of things, we should, we should find common ground and start working on that as soon as we can. And we put all of our input into uh, the department and, uh, through that. And then General Dickinson is a, is a big proponent of safe and responsible behavior. Uh, he demands it from his troops. Uh, and we work very hard to make sure that, hey, we're very clear. I think another big win would be having that type of international um, channel. Because right, if you don't understand what somebody's doing and you don't have some place where you can get a response, um, then hey, that's where miscalculations happen. 
And that's the worst thing is miscalculations from a guy who spent, you know, 30 plus years at sea. Um, if you're talking to an, uh, uh, a warship and you know they can hear you and they don't answer, um, that also tells you an intent uh, going through. So there, there's a lot of things I think we can do. Have I answered your question, Chris? That's, that's extremely helpful. And all of your answers uh, have been enlightening today. Unfortunately, I think we're out of time. Uh, I just want to thank first our audience for their participation today. Great questions. I'm sorry I wasn't able to get to all of the questions that were posed by our audience, but uh, glad to get through at least a few of them. And uh, Rear Admiral Bernanke, we want to thank you for your time today. Appreciate you appearing uh, on the Space Time interview series here, sir. And thank you for your service. And we will uh, look forward to our next uh, installment of Space Time interview series. Sir, thank you so much. Keep up the great work. And again, thanks for your service to our great nation. Thanks for having me, Chris. Yes, sir. Out here. Thank you all very much.